Hi, I'm Paul Germain, your host for Smart Boating. You know, this time of year, springtime, the trees are coming out, the flowers are coming out, and the boaters are unwrapping their boats. And uh, so initially what you do when you're a boater, you take an overview of the, the hull and the top sides, and uh, inevitably, uh, there's a uh, loss of gloss. Most boats aren't covered year round, and so that, that fine gloss that you got right out of the factory is no longer there. So there's a couple ways to resolve that. One is to get a new boat, and you get the new gloss, and the other way is to repaint your current boat. And within that, you can have a, the yard do it, or you can do it yourself. And that's kind of going to be our lead into the show today. We're going to look at how to restore the gloss on your hull or top sides through some uh, fairly basic techniques and uh, do-it-yourself technique. And joining us to guide us through that process is Steve Miller of Pettit Paint. Welcome, Steve. Hi, Paul. Good to see you again. Good to see you. Steve, uh, we're going to get into the show in just a second here, but can you share a little bit about your boating background and Pettit? Sure. I've been in the industry for about 40 years, Paul. Uh, started out as a young fellow as a commercial fisherman, but I've been involved with boat building and worked as a distributor uh, sales manager for a period of time before I went with Pettit. I've mm -hmm. been with Pettit Paint for about a quarter century, um, working on the road for them as their tech rep. Yeah, yeah. So you know a lot about paint. I've been both applying <laughs> it, <laughs> lifting it, and selling it. I know quite a bit about it. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's just the knowledge we need, so why don't we get right into the show? Sounds like a good thing to do to me. Okay. Well, Steve, you know, this whole area of, of, of painting your boat, uh, is, is a pretty big one. We can't get to all the different aspects today, but we can, I think, home in on some of the highlights. And, um, and that would uh, include uh, different tools that you could use to apply paints and the different types of paints. So uh, why don't we talk about the paints first and then kind of the differences in application second, right? Sure. It kind of fit together. So there's a, what, a two part and a one part. Yes, right? they're both uh, polyurethanes and the urethanes it's generally what we recommend for reinforced fiberglass okay. and stable, stable substrates. Okay. Um, but uh, they're both handled the same way and applied the same way, but they have definitely different attributes okay. and advantages. Okay. So can you tell us a little bit about that? Sure. Yeah. The, the single part paints are generally easier to apply. Mm -hmm. um, they're not catalyzed. They're just strained out of the can, okay. thinned and, and, and applied with a uh, roll brush or spray. Okay. Um, you end up with a very high gloss film, mm -hmm. which gives you multi-season gloss retention. Mm -hmm. The two-part paints are handled very similar, but they're okay. catalyzed. All right. And the advantages you get with the two-part products is certainly you get a much, much stronger abrasion resistance. Oh, you do. They're much harder films. Okay. Ideal for deck applications, high traffic areas. Mm -hmm. But you also get extended gloss with the two-part paints. Oh, okay. They break down slower to the ultraviolet light, so you get longer life, 20-25% uh, or more. Yeah. Now, are the two part, does the single part lend itself to more flexible in terms of application, like you can use a spray gun or the roll and tip method, whereas the two parts, it moves into a professional realm if they're going to try to use a spray gun? You can, you can handle the two part products, uh, do it yourself very effectively with the two techniques, either brush or preferably roll and tip. Mm -hmm. But the spray technique should be handled only by a professional. You okay. need fresh air exchange, like a scuba diver. Right. You're dealing with polyisocyanates, which as they build up in your system can be lethal, so it's nothing to fool around with. Not good. Right. No, but you don't run into that in, when you're brushing the product out. It's not atomized. You don't have any polyisocyanate atomized, so it's very safe to apply. You still wear your respirators okay. uh, and handle it just like the uh, single part product. So, okay, good. And for the purpose of our conversation today, they could go either way. With, uh, with regard to some of the qualities that you just pointed out. Absolutely. Yep. Both products are absolutely perfect sol uh, selections for reinforced fiberglass and uh, depends more on the, on the individual job and what you're trying to achieve as to which product you pick. Right, okay. Well, Steve, you know, uh, you're an expert in this area and I did a little research before the show just to kind of figure out some fundamentals. And one thing that stuck out at me was it seemed that there was a the high degree of importance with uh, preparing the surface correctly, and that was one of the places that oftentimes differentiated the do-it-yourself or at home and the pro. The pro really took the surface preparation seriously. What, what you, you build couldn't on that? have said anything more true, Paul. Mm -hmm. Absolutely emphatic that you get the mold release waxes off the surface and smooth and fair the surface before you do the job. Mm -hmm. If you don't, you're liable to lose adhesion or not have the finish you're looking for. Right. Ninety percent of the 
the way your job works is related to how you prep the surface. Surface prep. So with a couple different methods, but we're going to show them one. This is a brushing thinner that, you know, if you've been around boats or houses or anything, you've seen this. So can you show us what we do? Sure. Well, all I have to do is, uh, would you take the cap off there for sure. me? Yeah. Um, just pour it off into another container. This is a blended solvent. I'll take it. We got uh, uh, mineral spirits and uh, xylol in combination here. Mm -hmm. And it's an aggressive enough solvent that we use it in conjunction with a Scotch-Brite pad, which we wet with the solvent. Okay. And then we liberally wash the fiberglass surface. Okay. Now, it doesn't matter if it's a brand new boat or if it's been out and in use for 30 years. These mold release agents are not water soluble and they won't go away until you take a chemical to them. Okay. So you have to very, very liberally wash the surface wet and then take a dry rag immediately, opposite hand, mm -hmm. and wash the surface dry with the dry rag, get the solvent and the wax okay. off of the reinforced fiberglass surface. Now, is there a certain area you typically work with uh, uh, one time, or I guess the key is not to let it dry? The key is to get back with a dry rag as soon before the solvent evaporates it off. Dries. Yeah. Okay. So it's kind of a keep your feet in a stationary area where you, where you can reach with the left hand, wash, okay. and once you can dry with the right hand, dry, and then move on to the next section. Okay. Steve, first you, you apply the, uh, the cleaner, the solvent, you will, and then I guess the next step in, involves taping and sanding? Sure, you want to make sure you tape off the areas that you don't want to get paint or scratch marks from sandpaper on. Right. And uh, we tape those off with, uh, with safe release uh, masking tape mm -hmm. uh, so that glue residue isn't left behind. Mm -hmm. And there's a little technique when applying it, especially if you're looking down a long vessel with a rounded chine. A lot of people take their tapes and just go in little short increments and right. Foot match at a up time the line. Or two feet, right. Well, you end up getting the wave of the uh, ocean when you do that. You really have to stretch it out a you know, good 10, 12, 15 feet. Okay. And best to do it in conjunction with a buddy if you want to get a nice straight uh, line at the bootstripe. Okay. So, so we if can... you'd hold the edge of the tape, we'll kind of give a small demonstration of what we're talking about. Okay. Down about here, if you would. Oh, down here. Okay. Yeah. And then you just unwind the tape the entire distance you want to go. And then Hit that bootstrap straight line at the top, and your okay. buddy will start pressing the top of the tape right down smooth mm -hmm. with his fingers. Okay. And once you have that perfect line, just press the rest to the tape in place. Okay. And it's ready for the prep. Beautiful. So now you sand it, right? Now we sand the entire surface. Okay. This has already been de-waxed. Yeah. We put on our respirators. Yeah. What sort, of sand, uh, what sort of sandpaper are we using, Steve? We're what, using what a grit? 220 grit. 220. Yeah, wet, dry paper can be used for a regular production. Okay. I've got a little stick of disc on a hand sanding block. Okay. But it's 220 grit. If 220. you get coarse grit on there, it's yeah. going to show the scratch marks through All with right. the thin, thinly applied polyurethane. So go with the 220. You sand that surface, Paul, until you get a dull, frosty finish and all the gloss is gone. You put in a physical etch, some fingers for the paint to hold on to, some right. tooth for the paint to grab. Well, Steve, you know, oh, cleaners like this brush thinner here have been around for a long, long time. But there's some new ways, some perhaps less caustic, some less dangerous ways of, of, of cleaning. Can you share with us a little bit about how that yeah, works? Yeah, we, we do have a water dispersed, water soluble method of taking the wax off that would replace that. Um, point pollution that you have in your hands. <laughs> right. It's uh, pretty friendly to use. You apply it with a roller mm -hmm. and it, roll it out of a paint tray. Okay. Um, it's blue in color. Yeah. It's actually called Bio Blue. Okay. You get rid of the excess. I'm using a 316 snap roller. Okay. And the application is just like you were putting on a, on a can of paint here. Okay. You're going to apply to the area that has to be de waxed. Mm -hmm. The entire surface is okay. rolled out in this. Bio Blue DeWaxer. Okay. And once you have it on the surface, you can see where you have it. Yeah. This is the pigment. It's got a light blue to it. Okay. I know that I've applied it to all the areas. And now we work it in with a Scotch Bright pad. Okay. All right. And my Scotch Bright pad. It's close by. Is right here. Okay. And we work it in in circular motions. Okay. It has a little grit to it. So it will help remove the mold release waxes and at the same time get your sand dust off. Okay. And either technique can be used. You can use the solvent wash before you sand 
and also after you sand. Yeah. Or you can use the bio blue wash before you sand okay. and then after you sand to get rid of the surface. But this does a great job with those mold release agents and those other things that you're trying to get off, right? That's correct. Yeah. And the abrasive tool with the Scotch Brite works and picks up that wax. And after you've gotten that surface completely worked in, you liberally take water mm -hmm. and a sponge mm -hmm. and you wash the bio blue off. Okay. And that's the whole technique. Beautiful. Well, Steve, again, as I pointed out a little earlier in the show, I, I did a little research before the show uh, on the process, and, and they brought up the idea of primers. Uh, in some cases, they're important, and in some cases, they're not. Can you fill us in a little bit on that part? If I got a can of primer here, but I don't know when to use it and when not to. Sure, sure. The primer you have in our ha your hands there, our primer is very uh, universally used. It can be used underneath our two part paints mm -hmm. or our single part paints. Mm -hmm. And it can also be used on porous substrates or things like reinforced fiberglass that mm -hmm. are stabilized. Yeah. Now with the porous substrates, you always use the primer. Porous being like wood. Like wood. wood. Yep. You thin it down and drive it into the grain, okay. and that's absolutely necessary. Yeah. With reinforced fiberglass, it becomes an option. Oh, I see. And there's a couple of times that you might elect to use it. First would be if, this would be an example of a board that we wouldn't have to use the primer on. It's right. smooth, it's yes. fair, it's prepped and ready for paint. Right. But if it had some spider cracking, some in shallow imperfections, things that you can't put your fingernail into or fill a compound with, yeah. that's when we use the primer as a fairing paint. Yeah. And you roll and tip the product on just like we're going to show you with the, with the finished product, mm -hmm. same technique. But after this sets up the next day, you come back with a board sander and you sand it back hard. Yeah. You might remove the paint 50, 60, 70 percent of it, completely yep. taking it off the high points, okay. leave it in the shallows, the valleys, the cracks and the crevices. Right. With real imperfect surfaces, it may take more than one application to get the small lower points to come up to meet the high points. You're going to yeah. sand the high points down while yeah. you fill in the low. Yeah areas with paint. The peaks and valleys, right. Yeah. And then uh, we showed uh, repairs and if someone's doing a repair and it's got multiple colors, this is a nice way to get That's a uniform, That's the second right? option. That's right. right. Sometimes the repairs aren't white in color. Sometimes you're not necessarily painting with white. Uh, if you get a good solid base coat of one color, it's going to take you less coats of finish to mask and hide the product and uh, make your job complete. Okay. Well, Steve, you know, uh, a lot of people say you got to get the right tool for the job. And that's, that's as important in painting as anything else, I guess. And, and we've got some tools right here. We've got a roller and a couple brushes. Can you give us a little background on what are the appropriate tools for the roll and tip method? Sure. First of all, the urethanes, whether you're talking single component or catalyzed two-part linear urethane, you have to put the paint on very, very thinly. Mm -hmm. And the way to control that is with your roller. This is the tool that applies the paint to the job. And you want the nap of your roller to be very, very thin. This would be the heaviest we would want to use. It's 3 16 inch nap. Mm -hmm. You can go down from here to like an eighth inch for application, but certainly should not put it on any heavier than 3 16 Okay. The brushes mm -hmm. themselves, the way we apply the paint is a combination of roll and tip. Yeah. And I've got two brushes here mm -hmm. because depending on which product you use, my technique is slightly different for recommendation. Mm. If you're rolling on the single part paints, we use and apply the paint with the same roller, that puts the paint to the job, but we use the light, thin bristle brush, wet with product, we dip it in the can, get rid of the excess, and very gently tip off the bubbles with a wet brush. Mm -hmm. However, when I'm applying the two-part linear urethane, I still apply with the same technique of rolling on with the roller, same size roller, mm -hmm. but this time I tip off with foam and I tip off dry. I don't add any paint to the job with this. There's no dipping of the paint with the, with the uh, foam brush, it's just a dry brush tipping off the little bubbles that are in the surface. Okay, a little different. Now this, this brush here, Steve, the one that looks more like a traditional paintbrush, uh, is there a certain type of bristle or is there a certain well, it, width you should get or any other pointers in that that's area? That's a good question, Paul. And, and the answer is we don't want to add paint to the job with a brush. Mm -hmm. It's applied to the, to the substrate with a roller. So we want a brush that holds some paint but not a lot of paint. Okay. So the worst choice would be the heavy bristle badger hair brush oh. that we'd use for varnish, All which right. holds a lot of product. Oh, okay. The good choice would be the synthetic or nylon or, uh, bristles that are thin that don't hold a lot of paint because, again, we're not adding paint to the job with that tool. All right, we're just knocking down the bubbles. Right. And uh, is there a certain width that you find is uh, the right width to cover the right amount of area? Well, sometimes the substrate would dictate that, but generally I, I like to use around a three to four inch uh, brush to uh, cover a pretty good area when you're tipping off the bubbles. Okay, and again, any any pointers on the foam brush? Just Same thing, same technique. Uh, I like the foam going dry. You haven't got any bristles leaving marks. Mm -hmm. You can keep it in constant contact. 
Um, you actually, when you dry tip, you'll hear a little noise caused by the brush oh, yeah. uh, if, you, if you're keeping it in solid uh, surface contact. Mm -hmm. uh, and when the brush gets filled with some paint uh, from the job, you toss it and go to a new, new foam. Okay, okay, great. Well, Steve, as it's obvious to our viewers, before you uh, apply paint, you gotta, you gotta mix the paint, gotta get the paint together. So uh, can you show us that process? Sure, we've got the two-part linear urethane here, Easy Poxy 2. And basically you take part A, which is the pigmented side, and you stir it up liberally. Mm -hmm. If you have access to a paint shaker, that's always an advantage. Okay. But it's certainly been mixed by hand. Yeah. And after you've mixed part A, take another can, and we want to pour half of it off into the other can. Why just half? Because we're going to do all of our linear urethanes are always a, a two-step, two-application, two-coat okay. job. Oh, I see. Okay. And what we've got in here is enough paint to do the full job, and we actually catalyze it with, with Part B. Mm -hmm. In our packaging, Part B actually comes in two vacuum-sealed bags. Okay. So I've got two catalysts, one for half of Part A, and the other for second half of Part A, right, right. and you'll get the right ratios using that. Okay. Having these vacuum-sealed like we do dramatically extends the pot life of the catalyst. Mm -hmm go years before you worry about anything crystallizing oh, okay. on the shell. Okay. So you tear into the bag, mm -hmm. you take the catalyst, and you pour part B into half of part A. Okay, so it's so just a clear liquid. That's right. Mm -hmm. And we, we have the right ratio, because we know we measured up yeah. when we pour it off. Okay. And the first half of our job is now catalyzed, and what we have to do is stir part A and B together. Yeah. Now, how but, much working time are we going to have once they're combined, Steve? Well, you got probably two hours of pot life at a 70 degree temperature. Okay. A little bit longer pot life when the temperature is cooler because it catalyzes and sets up slower. Yeah. A little bit less time if it's real hot. And right. maybe right. if it's pushing that uh, 85, 90 degree day, you may be better off picking a good day to paint, which right. is the second secret beyond just your prep, you know. Okay. Uh, two important things to any paint job is the man prepping for the for the paint to come on, mm -hmm. and the second most important part is picking a good day to paint. Yeah. How about humidity? How does that enter into this whole process? Yeah, all, all of those condition changes uh, affect the paint, mm -hmm. and high humidity, high moisture in the air slows down and retards the dry. Mm -hmm. Usually warm temperature speeds it up, cold temperature slows it down. Mm -hmm. Windy conditions will speed up the setup of the product, whereas stagnant conditions will do the reverse. So okay. The conditions very much affect the setup of your paint. Yeah. Now I've got A and B liberally mixed up here. Mm -hmm. We use the same thinner, which is a blended solvent of xylol and mineral spirits. Mm -hmm. We use the same thinner for our single part or two part paint. Okay. But I want to put in, and could I get the cap back, please, yeah, sure. Paul? That roughly a half ounce of paint oh, I see. thinner measuring, in here. Measuring so I'm going to use it as a measuring tool. Okay. I've got roughly 16 ounces of paint in here, yeah. and I'm going to put in about three ounces of thinner, which is 15 percent. 15 percent thinner to the ratio of paint. What's the thinner going to do for us? What's the, what's the value of putting the thinner in Well, there? the thinner is certainly going to help the product self-level and get a nice smooth finish. Mm -hmm. It also, you know, retards a little bit the dry time, gives you a little bit more working time. Oh, I see. Um, and it is very important, as we've mentioned, with these two-part linear urethanes or the single-part urethanes that you put the product on very, very thinly. Okay. And uh, inducing a little thinner and that kind of forces your hand that direction. Helps it, yeah, okay. All right, so that's an important part of the process. Sure. Yeah. So I put the thinner in there and the catalyst in there, mm -hmm. and I've mixed it up well. Now we've got to put it to the job. Okay. But before we put it in the tray, we want to make sure that there's no contaminant in the surface or excuse me in the in the uh, liquid paint yes so we use a cone strainer okay. for applying the paint to the tray and all we do is all pour right. it off all right and it runs right through the small mesh of the cone strainer. Yeah. And if there were any nimby jimbies or particles in my paint here, right. this would strain it out. Right. Okay. So that's an important step. It's not an expensive purchase, these little paper cone strainers. No. no. But it's an important step to your job because the roller will pick up those particles and they'll end up in your surface and ruin your finish. <laughs> right. Steve, we're getting ready to do the actual roll and tip process here on our sample pad. And you've got a dust rag in your hand. And it just reminds me of the whole aspect of 
of dust control because that can really make a difference in your paint job. Are, are there some things you suggest to people to ensure that the dust they get is minimal in their paint? Well, there are a few suggestions. The most important things are, number one, picking a good day to paint. If okay. it's a real windy day, it's going to blow things into your job. Right. So picking a good day and also a good location is mm -hmm. paramount. And if you're doing it, if you have a garage or an indoor facility, even wetting down the floor so that dust isn't kicked up can help you. Right. But having said all that, we've already prepped our board. We've washed it and de-waxed it twice, and we've tried very hard to make sure it's prepped and ready for paint. Mm -hmm. But I always, at the end, take one last step. I take a tack rag, a little sticky cheesecloth, yeah. and I give it one more wash okay. to make sure if there's any stuff that has landed on the surface since we cleaned, it is off the surface to be painted. Because when you put that roller to it, if it's there, it's going to pick it up and put it in your job. It's going to end up there and possibly mar your finish. So you can't be too careful when it comes to cleaning the surface before you put the paint on. That's correct. Right. Okay. Can you show us how we apply the paint? Sure, I can. Now I use the old W method when I do the application. Mm -hmm. Make sure that you put it on thinly. Mm -hmm. Little pressure on the job. Okay, cover it uniformly. Keep it, you're keeping it basically all wet at this point, right? That is the technique. You put a little pressure on the job, you can see there's roughly a thousand bubbles in that square foot surface. Mm -hmm. But that's how we put the paint to the job. Okay. Now we have to deal with those bubbles. Right. I use a dry brush, brush when we're dealing. I use a foam dry brush, four inch, when we're dealing with these linear urethanes, the mm -hmm. two part. Mm -hmm. And I start at the rail and tip down with a little pressure okay. down to the water line. I see you flipping the foam brush around a little bit. Yes. Is there a reason for that? Well, what we're trying to do is not add paint to the job with this tool. We're just trying to knock off those bubbles. Right. When this brush gets full of paint, I actually toss it and go to a brand new brush. Okay. Because once again, we're not adding paint to the job with this tool. So we're making a very thin layer of paint on this surface, right? That is correct. Mm -hmm. And if we're doing this correctly, Paul, when you're done with this complete job, especially if you're changing colors, mm -hmm. you won't be satisfied with the finish. You'll say, boy, that didn't cover very well. I see a few shadows, holidays, maybe even a couple of spots that leave some streak marks. Mm -hmm. It has to be put on that thinly. If you achieve that, you're doing the job right, because this is going to require a second coat tomorrow. Right, and that's typical, right? So if someone doesn't, someone's applying this, they're not, they don't necessarily want to make the first coat cover. They want to get it on everything, but they don't want to like touch up spots before it dries, right? They want to catch that on the second time around. You're 100% right? right. The mm -hmm. biggest trap that people fall into is, gee, that isn't covering very well. They dip back into the tray and add right. some more paint. Like you do in your woodwork at home, but and this is a different thing. That doesn't fly with the two-part linear urethanes or the single-part urethanes. Yeah. You really have to put on thin, thin coats. If you don't, they'll skin over on the outside, cure on the outside, and trap the solvents. As the solvents leave the film, they pick up the skin. You get a very orange, peely, rindy finish which diminishes your gloss and requires another application. How many coats are typically uh, required or necessary if, for the If you're doing paint? the job right, whether it's a single part or two part linear urethane, mm -hmm. you can't finish the job with one coat right. and it shouldn't take you more than two. Okay, so two is a reasonable number. That's correct. Okay. And how long do you let it dry? I mean, let's say it was 70 degrees and low humidity, is there a certain dry time? Well, she'll get set to touch, uh, meaning that she's uh, She's no longer transferring paint onto your finger in about six hours of that temperature, but she's not ready to degloss and reapply until the next day, about 16 hours setup time. Okay. And honestly, the products, the single part product, uh, which is Moisture Cure, um, it's set to touch and, and tack touch, and the next day it's even ready to put a piece of Scotch Brite to, mm -hmm. but it's not completely set up and ready for service. You should let a boat cure for a good week or two, depending on ambient temperature, before oh. you put it into service. Before okay. you start hanging fenders off the side, it right. takes a little bit of time for it to completely solvent release and get completely hardened. Right, so if I can just build on something you said for a second there, 
you put the coat on and then the next day or week, if you will, whatever the timing is, you're going to knock that down a little bit with some sanding and then apply another thin coat? That's correct. I like to call it deglossing. I take a scotch Bright pad, take the gloss off the finish. You can use uh, sandpaper 220 grit mm -hmm. to, to achieve the same thing. Mm -hmm. um, but it's imp you don't want to sand hard and aggressively because okay. you put on a very thin coat. We don't want to sand through it. Okay. Uh, just basically take the gloss off the finish, right. tack rag it again to get rid of the sand dust, and reapply your second coat with the same technique. Okay. Well, Steve, you know it's hard to believe, but we're running out of time. We've got to wrap up the show today. It's been a really interesting subject, particularly for people that have older boats that they really like. It could be an old Mako, a whale, or whatever it is. Don't want to get rid of it. They can't afford it. They want to invest the money in a professional draw. They want to give a crack at it themselves. And it just seems, uh, you know, the process that we showed them with the different materials and, and the ways to apply things, this, uh, this is now within the reach of a lot of people viewing it from home, right? Oh, no question. No question about it. The, uh, the hardest part of the job, again, is the emphasis is on the prep. That's a work that anybody can do. Yep. They, they just have to be diligent with it. Yep. But uh, we, I think we've demonstrated the paints themselves. You can do it yourself. Right. There's no need to hire a professional. They're easy to handle. They're safe to handle. Mm -hmm. um, you do have to pay attention to the, to the techniques, not overapply the product. Right. Pick the good day to do it. Right. Um, but we have also plenty of support, Paul. There's mm -hmm. uh, technical people in the field. We have a, a customer service number, 800 number down in our plant. We have a lot of technical information on our website, was, which is very well designed. Tech sheets on each individual product and material safety data sheets on each individual product and uh, phone numbers to call if you, if you need some help. Right. So there's no reason the consumer can't uh, grab these products and do it themselves. Now there's some really good major manufacturers out there. You're among them. You guys get a website? We have a website. It's pettitpaint.com. Mm -hmm. Please remember, Pettit has two T's in the middle, P-E-T-T-I-T, <laughs> paint.com. Um, and the other guys as well uh, have websites, and they're yes. all informative. Yep. And they've got uh, linear urethanes just like the Easy Epoxy line. Yep. Um, sometimes it comes down to a matter of picking the color you want. Right, exactly. Uh, and uh, they're, they're all handling the products the similar way. The techniques that I showed you today can be used with my product and other paints too. Yes, yes. Steve? Thank you. Absolute pleasure, Paul. Thank you. Appreciate the time. And thank you, Smart Boating viewers, for joining us. If you have any questions or comments, uh, please visit us on our website, www.smartboatingus.com. I hope you'll come back again soon.